But we have to keep in mind that this is the Word of God. Did you hear me? This is the Word of God. Which means that men didn't just write it, but they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit to write it. And the God who produced it also protected it and also preserved it and also put it in my hands and your hands as the written revelation that guides us in life. So that we can do what? We can read it. We can pray it. We can sing it. We can meditate upon it. And, and when appropriate, we can personalize it. I want us to continue a series of messages I started last Sunday. And this series fits right in to what we're talking about today on Easter Sunday. I want you to pray with me. Father, I thank you today that you are with us. I pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our heart, to see things, Lord, that we might not see otherwise. It is so easy, Lord, to come into church and to just see the people around us, the walls, the carpet, and to not see you. I pray in the name of Jesus that we would truly experience God today. That can only happen, Lord, as your Holy Spirit enables us to realize that what we hear today, what we understand today are the truths that will stay with us through eternity. The things the children just sang about are the very truths that enable us, Lord, to say, I am a child of God. I believe in faith into the family of God. And I pray that today our faith will be strengthened. I pray today, Lord, that we will leave here with a firmer conviction that we serve a risen Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, it's so good to see you. And let me say thank you to the band. Let me say thank you to the praise team and to our children's choir. Everyone sounded so good today and did such a wonderful job. And I appreciate you sharing today, all of you. I want you, if you will, to take your Bible and turn with me to 20, uh, Psalm 23. It's also there in your app if you'd like to look there. Psalm 23. It's a YouVersion app. And it's got not only the text for this morning, but it's also got the outline for this morning. We've been in this series, and I'm not going to try to repeat everything I've been talking about for the last few Sundays and keep you through that, but I do want you to know that we're talking about the book of Psalms in the 23rd chapter, and it came about because as I was repeating the words of that psalm and just speaking it to myself and letting God just speak to me through the message, the Lord is my shepherd shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I begin to think about those words, those phrases, and the meaning in a new way. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We've already covered verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3 and part of verse 4, and I'm going to save the remainder of verse 4 for next Sunday and skip ahead to verse 5 today and share with you a little bit about how we see Psalm 23 in 2022, or as I call it, 23 in 22. These are familiar words from verse 5. The word of the Lord reads, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David is speaking here. David is writing here. And he's sharing from his heart a prayer, a poem, a song, a psalm that 3,000 years later we are still speaking. But what does it mean? How would I relate it today? Not that God's word changes. It doesn't. It's absolute truth for all time. But if I were to put it into my words today, because we speak these words to ourselves. The idea of meditation comes from the word mumbling, which means you actually talk to yourself. You kind of speak these things to yourself. How would I say it? I wrote this down in my journal. It's just my way of thinking about 
those words, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I wrote, you tell me, eat this, and tell my enemies, watch this. I like that. You tell me, eat this, and tell my enemies, watch this. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that there's a definite language shift beginning at verse 4. David moves from third person to second person. He moves from saying things like, he makes, he leads, he restores, his name. And he moves from that language to, in verse 4, you are, your rod, your staff, you prepare, you anoint. But if we take that into consideration and also add to that the fact that David's pronouns of personal reference are all throughout this chapter. My shepherd, I shall, makes me, leads me, restores my, I walk, I will fear, with me, comfort me, before me, and I could go on and on. David is personally invested in this story, and not only does he see himself in it, but he is a part of it. And then take into account something else, the book of Psalms was the hymn book of the Hebrew people. The hymn book of the Hebrew people. So these songs were sung by them. It means that they were written to be repeated. It means that they were penned to be personalized. They were relational songs because they relate to the stories of everyone that sang them and everyone that's here today. Now I know that we always have to consider the context what did the verse before it say? What did the verse after it say? What does the chapter say? What does the book say? How does it relate to the context of Scripture? There's also historical context and cultural context. And we have to think about literary context and rhetorical context. And all of these things are important. All of these things matter. But we have to keep in mind that this is the Word of God. Did you hear me? This is the Word of God. Which means that Men didn't just write it, but they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit to write it. And the God who produced it also protected it and also preserved it and also put it in my hands and your hands as the written revelation that guides us in life. So that we can do what? We can read it. We can pray it. We can sing it. We can meditate upon it. And, and when appropriate, we can personalize it. And I think Psalm 23 is one that we have personalized over and over again. But think about that. We have said, the Lord is my shepherd. Ben Patterson writes this, if God were not really this way toward each of us personally, the Lord is my shepherd. To pray this psalm then would be to engage in an act of almost criminal narcissism. It would. The Lord the God of the universe, the creator of all, is my finite, a mist, is my shepherd. Think about that. Now I want us to focus on the first part of verse 5 for just a moment. You prepare a table before me. I was reading a new book this week by Louis Giglio. It's a great little book called At the Table with Jesus. I never thought much about a table. I read this week about a table that sold for over $4 million because of who made it and when they made it. But I don't think that much about a table. A table's a table, but Louis Giglio brought out some good thoughts. He said, the more I think about it, the more I realize that tables have a symbolic significance. They matter. He says, tables are connected to some of the most important and meaningful moments in our lives. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to kind of use your imagination for a moment. When we're at home, for example, we're around the table. We gather around a table with those nearest and dearest to us. We had our first dates around a table. Remember? How many of you remember that? Some of you will be in trouble. 
I'll never forget. I mean, Burger King, Dairy Queen, Pizza Hut. I wanted to make sure she loved me for me. <laughs> Around the table. We celebrate golden anniversaries at tables. We forge new friendships at tables. That's why I've been inviting so many of you to the meal that we're going to be having. Is it May 1st on Sunday evening? So I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I couldn't remember. We're going to gather around tables and, and not just worship in the same building, but look each other in the eye and converse and get to know each other. How wonderful is that? That happens at the table. We teach our kids important lessons at the table. How many times have you seen commercials about the importance of family sharing meals together? And how that, that lost tradition has left a lot of young people lost in terms of character and values being passed from generation to generation. We even make business deals by shaking hands over and signing papers. On what? Conference tables. In a lot of ways, he writes then, a table is an icon of influence, of access. When you let someone join you at a table, you're inviting them in, bringing them close, opening yourself in a way that is vulnerable. But I want you to consider the importance of the table in your own life, he writes. Specifically what I call the table of your mind. I never heard of that, but I like it. Psalm 23, 5 says, and he shares this in his book, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love that imagery, he writes. In my mind's eye, I see a green field where my enemies are prowling around. Is that what you see? They're looking for a way to destroy me. Yet right there, right in the middle of the wolves and the hyenas, I see the good shepherd setting up a table and inviting me over. I don't have to worry when I sit down at the table. I don't have to protect myself or say anything to justify myself against my foes. Why? Because I'm at the table with the king of the universe. Notice what he said, and he literally saw the Savior as a shepherd, and he saw himself as a sheep, and he saw wolves and hyenas as those enemies, the, the prey that wanted to get to him, and yet in the midst of his enemies, the shepherd not only protected him, but provided a meal before him. The NIV Grace and Truth Study Bible gives us another idea of who those enemies might be. It says, David's enemies watch but cannot disrupt the special meal. They watch, but they can't be a part of it. Perhaps they are captives at a post-war celebration. That's an image, isn't it? Or perhaps the host is strong enough that they dare not disrupt the meal. Who do you see when you say those words? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Whose faces come to mind? I know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So I'm not just talking about people, but I'm talking about the spirit that they bring to the table. I was thinking about the different kinds of enemies. And I got out my journal and I wrote some down. You say, well, an enemy's an enemy, Pastor, but maybe not. The first one that came to mind is not original to me. How many of you have heard of a frenemy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a word that you'd probably find in a dictionary now. In fact, I found it in a dictionary. Merriam-Webster says a person who is or pretends to be a friend but was, who is also in some ways an enemy or a rival. They pretend to be a friend, but they're really an enemy or a rival, a frenemy. And then I, I came up with some of my own as I sat there. See if you relate to any of these. Kenemy. Someone you really don't care for, but your relationship is relative. <laughs> I.e., mama won't let you kill him. Another person, another enemy around that table, I call, where do I begin to me? It's not a love story, but it's a long story. So you just simplify things by saying, it's complicated. I see another enemy called Cinnamy. I wrote this, they were good to have around when you felt like being bad, 
You don't really like them much, but now they know too much. How about this one? Penemy. P-E-N-N. Penemy. Their friendship isn't worth a dime, but as long as you've got one, you can't get rid of them. Ever had an enemy like that? Or Zenemy. Z-E-N. Zenemy. If it wouldn't disturb your peace of mind, you'd give them a piece of your mind. I see another enemy there. I call it Daniel and the lion's denemy. You ought to see how I spelled that. It's really cool. <laughs> Daniel and the lion's denemy? Yeah, you don't like each other, but as long as they keep their mouth shut, everything will be okay. <laughs> how about this? I know everybody's got a, an enemy like this. Winemy. A winemy. W-H-E-N. The only time you hear from them is when they need something from you. Whenever they phone you, you immediately start the countdown clock as you wait for those inevitable, inevitable words. Listen, the reason I called is, <laughs> y'all got a friend like that too, don't you? How about this? Venomy, venomy, T-H-E-N. I wrote, it's a mystery they're your friend until you understand the history of your then. If you had a picture of them, you'd probably choose a frame in the shape of a rearview mirror. Your conver conversations bring to mind a Michael Jackson song because they all begin with the same words. Do you remember the time? The only thing you have in common is the past. How about this? End me, E-N-D. For better or for worse, it seems that you're together till the end. Your commitment to this lack of commitment you feel toward each other causes you both to say, I don't like you, and I always will. These are not things that I recommend, but these are real enemies that we have around the table. How about skinemy? Skinemy. That token friend you keep around so you can truthfully say, some of my best friends are red, yellow, black, white. But they don't mind because they keep you around for the same reason. I wrote, it's a relation based on pigmentation. Lendomy. We've all got a lendomy. L-E-N-D. Parting is such sweet sorrow, but you can't say bye to you. Get back all they borrowed. But I think of Jesus, and I think of Easter, and I think around that table of another kind of friend. I call him Grenemy. Oh, they smile, but don't trust that smile. They grin, but look deeper. I wrote this. They have the unique ability to listen to you talk about a cross while seeing you in their crosshairs. They have the unique ability to kiss you on the cheek as they stab you in the back. Does that sound like anybody you know? I think about Jesus. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But personally, when I think of that, I think of my childhood. A long, long time ago. I think of something that my mom shared with me, but I remember vaguely. My brother and I were sitting on a little porch that led down some steps. And it was right outside the, the front door. And remember screen doors? Screen doors were, were wonderful because, you know, that sound they make just is so soothing. But also because you can see things and hear things that are going on. And my brother and I were sitting out there. Rusty, he's been on TV a lot recently, doing a lot of great things with the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. And people be calling and say, yeah, I saw him on national TV doing that, that's, that's great, but let me tell you what he's really like. <laughs> we were sitting there, and he's, he's two years and 11 months older than me, and mom had given us popsicles, and Rusty, as soon as she left, you can hear the screen door close, told me, he said, you don't need to eat that, it's poison to little children. Old, older kids can eat popsicles. And he took my popsicle. He did not know that my mom was standing there behind the screen door where you can see everything and hear everything. And so as he began to eat 
his popsicle and my mama threw that door open and she broke a lot of laws because she yanked him up and she whooped him good. But the best part of it was she gave me back my popsicle and she gave me his popsicle. And I got to eat them in the presence of my enemy. I remember that. I don't know what it means to you, but all kinds of enemies come to mind. But look at the next part of verse 5. You anoint my head with oil. How do you think of that in 2023? What does that look like? You anoint... I had to think about hearing the phrase today and what it would mean. So I wrote this. You break out the essential oils and use them on me. Everybody's talking about essential oils today but they don't want to use theirs on you because that is pure that is concentrated and that is valuable but it says you anoint my head with oil now I want you to understand something there are different types of songs I've talked about the fact that there are five books within the book of Psalms and those books in many ways parallels the, fair, the, parallel the five books of the Pentateuch or the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We see similarities. There is such a great wisdom, the wisdom of God in, in how this book was given to us. And there are different types of psalms. There are praise psalms, hallel psalms, hallelujah. There are lament psalms where we can almost feel the grief that someone is going through as they pour out their heart to God. I love that transparency in the Psalms. There are imprecatory Psalms and there are even messianic Psalms, just to name a few. We talk about Psalm 23, but sometimes we forget about Psalm 22. It is a messianic Psalm. What does that mean? It means it points prophetically to Jesus the Messiah. It tells us things that we can see only fulfilled when we understand the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to read all of Psalm 22, but what I want you to do is watch the screen because I'm going to share a quick video called Psalm 22 that shares some highlight verses and see if you don't see the crucifixion, the Christ, in Psalm 22. I want us to understand that Psalm 22 is not the only chapter that can cause us to see and think of Jesus Christ. As we celebrate Easter, we need to remember something. We need to remember that Psalm 23 speaks of the shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. I thought about 
preaching some of these points, but then as I was writing in my journal, they came out poetically. And so I just want to share this poem today, but I don't want you to listen to it just as a poem. I want you to listen to the points, the, the meaning, because within each line is found a, a part of not only the story of Psalm 23 and Psalm 22, but our story. I call it inside the numbers, inside the numbers. Listen. If we considered psalms the way that humans count their own birthdays, the psalm we know as 23 would then be called, would have to be, big brother to those down the line, like 20, 14, 10, and 9. It seems to me, if not to you, that's how folks view verse 22. Chapter 22, let me go back. It seems to me, if not to you, that's how folks look at 22. It's in the word, but let's be real. It's probably not as big a deal as P-S-A-L-M-2-3, a psalm of D-A-V-I-D. But let me spell out something else. The truth, a truth that might provide some help. The Bible is a book of books. But if we take a closer look, we learn that stuff like chapter verse was added to God's holy word to help us when we need to find that one specific thought or line. Because 2 Timothy 2.8 is something we can all locate. But some, finding some wherever psalm might complicate our shall not want. That takes us back to Shepherdville, which we can't understand until we learn to change the way we view the chapter known as 22. This messianic prophecy puts me in mind of Calvary. In fact, verse 1 was quoted by Messiah as he bled and died. Verse 7 and also verse 8 describe the people there that day who mocked the Savior as he bled, made faces as they shook their heads. Verse 16 speaks of hands and feet they pierced by nailing to a tree. Then those who viewed such pain and loss, the characters around the cross, in verse 18, they gambled for the very garments that he wore. Yes, I believe those words describe my Savior being crucified. Disjointed bones and dried up strength, his body thirsting for a drink. And other verses I could list which speak of that but point to this. Yet they connect organically to what comes next in 23 as David paints a portrait of a shepherd who protects and loves. Some verses may or may not be clear messianic prophecies, and yet they form a mental link that makes me scratch my head and think. I know what some of you might say, you've just got Jesus on the brain, and now you see him everywhere. Well, that's a badge I'd gladly wear. Because if a verse reminds me of the Lord's John 10, 11 love, the shepherd who lays down his life, then I can't help but worship Christ. In pastures David wrote about, I see a sermon on a mount where flocks of people came and heard a shepherd feed them with the word. The quiet waters giving rest foreshadowed a disciple's test, a metaphor that was fulfilled when Jesus whispered, peace be still. But while in 22 we see the crucifixion imagery, in chapter 23 we find a picture of a different kind. In verse 3, he restores my soul. can also read, just so you know, the shepherd, he restores my life, which points again to Jesus Christ. Because Hebrews 13, 20 says that God raised Jesus from the dead, revealing Christ's identity as that great shepherd of the sheep. Emmanuel means God with us. And if those words are not enough, the son of David, son of God, eternity inside a bod. He lives in incarnation land all by himself, both God and man. But here's a name that's truly deep. The shepherd who became a sheep and then became the sacrifice, the lamb of God who gave his life. But like those Easter lyrics say, oh, death, it cannot keep his prey. The tenses just go back and forth. He was and is forevermore. 
His death and resurrection mean that 22 and 23 are different, yet they're still the same. Arose by any other name. Psalm 23 was never just a sedative prescribed for us. A glass of milk before bedtime, a shepherd's tale, a nursery rhyme. So go with me to 23 and study shepherdology where we'll find David and ourselves as well as everybody else who needs the shepherd's staff and rod to make it to the house of God. Would you bow your head with me? My thought this morning was unique. I thought about a time many years ago when soldiers were returning from the Vietnam War. Now when they went to war, I'm sure people were able to see them off and wish them well, let them know they'd be praying for them, even celebrate them. But even as young as I was, I remember soldiers coming back from serving their country and there being nothing of a welcome, nothing of that celebration in so many cases. Because our own country, as it is again today, was in an absolute mess. Last week, we talked about a triumphal entry, and we always sing those festive, joyous, celebratory songs. Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But those people on Resurrection Sunday weren't there to celebrate Jesus. They were hiding in their houses, as a lot of people are today. They weren't singing Hosanna and praise and glory because as far as they were concerned, things were in a mess. And they didn't see any hope for the future. And they were scared to even be seen doing and saying such things. And there's a lot of people today who feel the same way. That's your private belief. Just keep it inside the house. But I think the triumphant entry needs to kind of be transferred to the outside of a tomb where up from the grave he arose. I think we ought to be singing and praising and worshiping and thanking God on Easter Sunday the way we do on Palm Sunday because he is risen. I think we ought to be waving the palm branches and I think we ought to be throwing down our coats and singing glory to God in the highest. Singing, oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. We ought to be doing that today because he is alive. He is alive. And we have hope and we don't have to hide in our homes or keep the celebration to ourselves. He is risen. And right now, before New Day comes to share a a song that feeds into this thought so well, I want you to just, in whatever way you would, by that I mean lifting your hands, lifting your voice, lifting your eyes, or just in the privacy of your own devotion, would you just celebrate God? Would you just celebrate Christ? He is risen. And let's see ourselves outside the tomb, not at the entrance to Jerusalem, but at the entrance to the rest of the story as Jesus comes forth from the tomb and we celebrate and give him the glory we did not. Father, we thank you today. We praise you for your son, Jesus. 
In many ways, it seems like our praise has been silenced the last couple of years by circumstances way outside of our control. But what a gift to be together today. What a blessing. But Lord, not to sit here and to lament, but to sing psalms of praise. Because the Lord lives and He is my shepherd. And the Lord lives and He guides and protects me. The Lord lives and He's going to lead me to His home forevermore. Father, we praise You. And Jesus, we celebrate You as our risen Lord. In the face, Lord, of circumstances again in this world that seem out of control and might cause us if we went by human emotions to hide, we look and we say, wait a minute. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds my future, life is worth the living just because He lives. He lives. He lives. We are so glad that you were here today with us to worship. I pray that something that you heard today will go with you this week. And remember that God loves you and we do too.